Questions orales, oral questions, the Honourable Member from South Surrey, White Rock. Breaking news, Mr. Speaker. Rent spiked in October at the highest rate in 40 years. Rents up, taxes up, prices up, interest rates up. This Prime Minister's reckless spending is causing pain. Scotiabank says mortgage rates would be two full percentage points lower if the government would just control its spending. Canadians are at risk of losing their homes when they renew their mortgages. 2% is the difference between making it and breaking them. Will the Prime Minister end his reckless spending so that Canadians can keep their homes? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, wishes to talk about Canadians keeping their homes. Let's look at the Conservative record on housing. When the now opposition leader was the so-called Minister of Housing, $300 million were allocated towards housing. How many homes were built? Less than 100, Mr. Speaker. Wow. The record speaks wow. for itself. Across the country, we've signed deals with many municipalities, Kelowna, London, Hamilton, Halifax, Calgary, the list continues. We're going to continue to work with municipalities with partners across the way uh, to make sure that we get homes built. This is an obligation and we are up to the task. Here, here. The Honourable Member from South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, photo ops don't build homes. And when our leader was not the so-called minister, he was the minister, rent was lower, down payments were lower, housing was lower. It was a much more affordable place eight years ago than it is today in Canada. Here at home, in a time when Canadians are struggling with the cost of everything, the Prime Minister wants to quadruple the carbon tax. He's just not worth the cost. Will he show some compassion and cancel the NDP Liberals' cruel plan to quadruple the carbon tax on the back of struggling Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. In a week where that party has been exposed for what they are, that is, a party that does not stand in alignment with the principles of freedom, they've turned their back on the Ukrainian diaspora and on Ukrainians. It's hard to take anything that side has to say seriously today. But on the matter of housing, Mr. Speaker, $40, $46 billion has been allocated towards housing. And the result is that 2 million Canadians have been housed, they've had homes built, they've had homes repaired, and homes subsidized, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue this work. Here, here. The Honourable Member from South Surrey, White Rock. Mr. Speaker, this is the government that sent turbines to Putin yeah. so he can pump natural gas into Europe and fund his war machine. We should end dollars for dictators and turn them into paychecks for our people. The Prime Minister gave $15 billion to Stellantis in Windsor without protecting Canadian jobs. $15 billion being used to bring up to 1,600 foreign replacement workers. Let's see the contract. Let's see the details. Will the Prime Minister release the contract, let Canadian workers see for themselves how many jobs are going to foreign replacement workers? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, Mr. Speaker, what's becoming clearer and clearer every day is that the Conservative leader of the, today is just not worth the risk. Quite frankly, the far-right element of Canada is actually taking over the Conservative Party today. Mega. We saw that, Mr. Speaker, in the actions of all Conservative members voting against the Canada-Ukraine trade agreement. Shame. Completely amazing, Mr. Speaker. It shows a lack of leadership. Yep. The leader of the Conservative Party is moving it far to the right. Inexcusable, Mr. Speaker, and shame on every Conservative member for joining with The Honourable Member for Megantic Mr. Speaker, these budget project projections that only a contortionist could appreciate. That's, the, that's a quote from Desjardins about this mini-budget. This prime minister has lost all fiscal credibility. Next year, we will be paying $51 billion to service the debt. That's double the amount we're using for national defense and as much as our health transfers. It shows that this prime minister is just not worth the costs. Will the Liberals show some common sense, balance their budget, 
and help Canadians balance their own budget and be able to put food on the table. The Honourable Minister of Innovation, Mr. Speaker, for those watching us at home this Friday, they know that these Conservatives are just not worth the risk. There is something that's going up here, and that's foreign investment in the country. But the Conservatives don't want to talk about that. Canada is now third in the entire world in attracting foreign investment after the U.S. and Brazil. We have received record investment in the auto sector, the mining sector, in batteries, steel, aluminum. Mr. Speaker, we will continue fighting to make sure that Canada joins the economy of the 21st century. The Honourable Member for mégantique lérable Well, my colleague should fight more for Canadians. Does he want numbers? Well, we have the fastest inflation in 40 years. Two million people, a record number, going to food bags in one month. Housing costs doubled. Mortgages have increased by 150 percent. Deposits to buy a house have doubled. Housing overall is 50 to 75 percent higher in Canada than the U.S. This government should be ashamed. All of all experts agree. Liberal spending has made costs go up. When will this government finally tell us when they will return to an accountable, balanced budget? The Honourable Minister of Innovation, Mr. Speaker, what people want in this country, what they need is leadership, and that's what we showed in our mini-budget. Canadians told us two things, two specific things. Help us with affordability and help us with housing, and that's exactly what we're doing with a mini-budget, Mr. Speaker. And what's more, we have announced the biggest reform in 30 years of the Competition Act, because in this country we want less cons consolidation, more competition, better prices for Canadians. We will continue fighting for Canadians every day. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean, Mr. Speaker, the federal government must give to Quebec the $460 million that it has spent to help asylum seekers. This is an area of federal jurisdiction. Quebec is doing much more than its fair share, and now the federal government must do its own work to help with the situation. And not only did the Minister of Immigration refuse, but he actually had the arrogance to claim that he, that too much money had been given to Quebec. He even said that he might be sending the bill to Quebec. Instead of picking fights like this, why doesn't the minister go get his checkbook out so that we can actually help asylum seekers? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Mr. Specker, what I said publicly yesterday is that we need to sit down with Quebec, with our respective finance ministers, so we put all our cards on the table. If we add up all of the excess sums that we included in the Canada-Quebec agreement, we'd see that actually Quebec would, would be the one receiving the bill. But that's something that I really hesitate to do in public. I'd much prefer to dis discuss it privately with my colleagues from Quebec, because we want to work together for immigrants and asylum seekers. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean, Mr. Speaker, the minister spoke about excess monies. Has he ever even met an asylum seeker or an organization that supports them? Because on the ground, no one is going to say that there's too much money for asylum seekers. It's not a matter of too much money. These people don't even have the right to work because they're not getting permits from the federal government. You can't start talking about too much money when people are sleeping in tents during the winter. There's not too much money. There's too much petty politics on the backs of vulnerable people. When will the minister stop playing politics and give the money to Quebec? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Well, petty politics, Mr. Speaker, is to presume that this is a one-way relationship. No, it takes two to tango. Very clearly, this is an area of shared jurisdiction, and that's what we're trying to do here. With the Canada-Quebec Agreement, Quebec has the responsibility and duty to welcome asylum seekers. We can work together. The Bloc Québécois and their friends in the National Assembly who seems to be sending them questions, they're taking a reductionistic approach. I'm asking them to sit down with us. We can all work together. The Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby. Mr. Speaker, a 30-year-old from Sherbrooke isn't, isn't able to find affordable housing, and so Alexandre will be spending his first winter in the streets. This is a new wave of homelessness, according to the Sherbrooke Renters Association. Between Liberal and Conservative governments, Canada has lost a million affordable housing units over the last 17 years.
people need to have homes today, not in two years. When will the Liberals finally take action and build social housing? People need that now. Secretary. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Oui. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, it's true. There is a housing crisis in our country. Our government's approach is an example of cooperation. That's the way that I actually want to do something on housing, cooperation with provinces, cooperation with municipalities, and the not-for-profit sector. To take an example, the national housing strategy is getting people housed. Thousands of people across the country who did not have a home have a home now, who were homeless, are now able to access the wraparound supports they need in order to have something better. We have more work to do. We're going to get it done. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member from New Westminster, Burnaby. Pretty words like that do not put a roof over the head of the thousands of Canadians that are sleeping out in the streets of our country tonight. And seniors are there too, Mr. Speaker. A retired couple in Holyrood, Newfoundland, with teachers' pensions, were just forced to sell their home. They spent their whole lives working to teach our kids, but they can't afford to live there anymore. Food price gouging is hurting them badly, and their pension can't keep up. Will the Liberals support the NDP's plan to lower food prices by stopping price gouging to give seniors like them a needed break now? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that we do have the NDP support on Bill C-56, and as you know, there are competition measures in that that will hold grocery chains to account. On the question of housing, the more we build, the more we ensure that costs come down. And I have good news for the member. Right across the country, we see residential construction up. In Manitoba, it's up 34 percent. In Saskatchewan, 25 percent. In New Brunswick, 23 percent. Alberta, 11 percent. Newfoundland, 10 percent. Quebec, 9 percent. In, um, in my province of Ontario, 7 percent. It is working. We have a plan. We're going to get it done, as I said, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member from Parry Sound, Muskoka. Rent is up. Interest rates are up. Mortgages are up. Groceries are up. Taxes are up. Debt is up. And Canadians are fed up. Bank of Canada Governor, Scotia Bank economists, they're all sounding the alarm bell. This NDP Liberal government's massive borrowing is making everything more expensive for Canadians. With two million people using food banks now, we know this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. So when will he stop the inflationary borrowing that is hurting so many Canadian families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. What's up, Mr. Speaker? Well, let me tell you what's up. What's up is jobs are up, foreign direct investment is up, home building is up, support for Canadian families is up, women's labour market participation is up. Let me tell you what's down, Mr. Speaker. What's down is inflation is down, food prices are down, unemployment is at a historic low, and the cost of childcare is down, and Canada has the lowest deficit and net debt to GDP ratio in the G7. Conservatives want to cut and move to austerity while we continue to invest in Canadians. The Honourable Member from Parry Sound, Muskoka. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, housing starts are actually down in Canada, so I don't know what fiction that member is listening to. Perhaps it's the Minister of Finance who thinks that the dream of home ownership has never been so good in this country. The SNDP Liberal government will spend more on interest on the debt next year than on health care. So my question is simple. When will the Prime Minister stop abusing the national credit card, cancel his $20 billion in extra inflationary spending and borrowing, balance the budget, bring down interest rates so that Canadians can afford to live in this country? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I recognize that Conservatives want to try and claim that we're fiscally irresponsible. What I say is irresponsible is downplaying our economy when we're faring better than any G7 country in the world. What is irresponsible is voting against the Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement and abandoning yeah. Ukrainians in their time of need. What's irresponsible is calling an incident at the border a terrorist attack without having the facts. You know what that shows? That shows a lack of judgment. It shows risky and reckless behavior. and. Well, that's all I've got to say. <laughs> the Honourable Member. 
You all remember from Saskatoon Grasswood. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. After eight long years of this Liberal government, Canadians by the millions are depending today on food banks. Yet on Tuesday, this NDP Liberal government released its mini budget adding another $20 billion in inflationary spending. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will this government cut the line of credit so Canadians can afford to eat, heat and keep a roof over their heads? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, while our government has stayed steadfast in our commitment to support Canadians with affordability challenges, evidenced by Budget 2023 and now the fall economic statement, we've seen the Conservatives this week flip-flop multiple times and showcase their risky and reckless behaviour and judgment. They say they're committed to supporting Ukraine, but then they abandon them in their time of need. We also have seen Conservatives stand up and oppose the affordability Act, and yet last night they all stood up and voted for it. So why don't they come clean and let Canadians know where they stand? Here, here. The Honourable Member from Saskatoon Grasswood. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That member should know that Conservatives actually were the ones to successfully negotiate the current Canada-Ukraine trade agreement. And a common-sense Conservative government would modernize the existing agreement without this expensive Liberal carbon tax. Ukraine does not need this woke agenda. This Prime Minister has added more debt than the previous 22 Prime Ministers combined. When will he put the checkbook away? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we hear more and more that the leader of the Conservative Party is just not worth the risk. The bottom line is, is That's that the true. Conservatives might have supported the free trade agreement with Canada and Ukraine years ago, yep. but just the other day, yep. every one of them, with the leader of the Conservative Party leading the pack, voted against the Canada-Ukraine trade agreement. There is no way they can get out of that fact, Matt, Mr. Speaker. That is the reality. You have betrayed Ukraine, and it's shameful in terms of what you have conducted yourselves in the last couple of days. Then I, have dip I would like to remind all members, of course, that comments are brought through the chair. Um, then I have dip the Honourable Member for Belle Chasse, Les Gichemin Levy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last eight years, this Prime Minister has added billions of dollars to the debt, more than all 22 previous Prime Ministers. Just imagine, next year he will spend more money to service his debt than on the health transfers to the provinces. It's very clear that this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Why are the Liberals refusing to present a plan for a, pal a balanced budget to lower interest rates and inflation, as we've been asking? Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative leader has called our plan disgusting, yet he's hiding his cuts from Canadians. What would the Conservative leader cut? Would he cut EV factories for Windsor, St. Thomas and Quebec? Would he cut CCUS investment tax credits for projects in Alberta? Would he cut clean hydrogen investment tax credits for projects in Newfoundland? Mr. Speaker, our government is delivering an economic plan which is balanced and fiscally responsible. Conservatives should come clean with Canadians and let us know where they're going to cut. The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse, Les Echemalévy. Well, Liberals have been talking about their waste all day. But the numbers are clear. Two million Canadians are going to food banks every month. A family of four will have to spend $1,065 more this year for groceries. Students having, are having to sleep in shelters. Mortgage payments have doubled. And all of this mess bears the mark of this prime minister, who is not worth the cost. Will he at least have the decency and humility to admit that it's, it is because of his inflationary spending that our country is in a deplorable situation, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of in Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate my colleague's question, and I even have an idea for her. 
if she is so worried about affordability, Mr. Speaker, well, Christmas is coming up. Maybe she should give Canadians a present. She should vote in favor of Bill C-56. Why? Because in Bill C-56, we will reform our competition system, which is a reform we've needed for 30 years. We'll have less consolidation, more competition, better prices. She should convince all of her colleagues to move this bill forward to help Canadians for Christmas. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, less than a month ago, Quebec announced that 547 jobs would be eliminated. That's a third of its workers. But that doesn't seem to bother the Minister of Heritage at all. Nothing in the economic statement, not a single penny for our TV and radio. This crisis in the media is a democratic crisis. Our access to information is being threatened, especially in our rural regions. Our culture and our, our sense of belonging is also being threatened, but the minister is not doing anything. Why? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my colleague on the fact that the media is in a crisis. That is why we've been there from the beginning. We've created new programs to support our information media. We modernized the Broadcasting Act. I'm sorry, I will just ask the minister to start over. Can I ask members on both sides to stop having discussions between themselves? It makes it hard to hear the answer. It's hard for, it's hard for me to hear, and I can't imagine that the member for Drummond, who's at the back of the room, will be able to hear it. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, our government has been there since it came to power in 2015 to help the cultural sector, to help it face the crises and disruption brought by foreign platforms into our market. That's why we modernized the Broadcasting Act and the CRTC is currently consulting with broadcasters, platforms and people in the cultural industry to see how we can better support our TV and radio and help them face our current reality. This modernization will bear fruit over the next weeks and months. I will continue to work closely with my colleague on these matters. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, the work has been going on for a long time. We need to see some results. We've seen a lot of reactions from the cultural sector, and these are people who are horrified to see that there's nothing for them in the economic statement. Even the Fédération Nationale des Communications, an organization the minister knows well, has said that electronic media has been completely forgotten in the economic update. The Bloc Québécois is asking for an emergency fund of $50 million to give the media a break while waiting for the minister to finish negotiating with the web giants. $50 million is nothing for the federal government, but it's a lot for our media. Ottawa is refusing to do this not for financial but political reasons. Why is the minister abandoning our information media, especially our electronic media? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we looked at the Bloc Québécois idea. We have spoken with various stakeholders in the cultural sector. But unfortunately, this $50 million fund would not fix the problem. What will be a long-term solution would be modernizing our legislation, as we've done, and improving the payroll tax credit program, which we amended in the fall economic statement, to continue helping our newsrooms we will keep looking at all possible solutions. But what people know in the cultural sector is that the Conservatives wouldn't have done anything and that our government has been doing things since it came to power in 2015. The Honourable Member from Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, the NDP Liberal Coalition's economic update is out. Prices are up, rent is up, debt is up, taxes are up, and time is up for this costly coalition. Billions more in tax dollars will be spent and Canadians will still be struggling. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Mr. Speaker, will this government adopt our common sense plan to balance the budget, or will they step aside and let a Conservative government clean up their mess? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, uh, it's been actually kind of humorous to watch this week as Conservatives twist and flail like pretzels, turning themselves into things and trying to make people believe they are there for workers. Let's review what they've been doing, Mr. Speaker. 
Currently, they're filibustering the Sustainable Jobs Act at Natural Resources, a bill that gives workers a seat at the table in the clean economy, which represents 400,000 jobs before 2030. They're opposing landmark legislation that our government tabled to ban replacement workers, which is good for workers and enables them at the bargaining table. And not only do Conservatives have no credibility when it comes to standing up for workers and jobs, Mr. Speaker, but they have no vision for the future of our economy. Great. The minister, member has fallen out of time. Uh, the Honourable Member from uh, Yellowhead. I think the only people that are believing these talking points are still the Liberals already. Yes. Mr. Speaker, Senators appointed by this Prime Minister shut down debate on a common sense bill to axe the carbon tax for farmers. This NDP Liberal coalition is blocking important tax carbots on grain drying and barn heating. Their actions driven by failed policies directly harm Canadian producers and increase food costs. Mr. Speaker, will this government finally support hard-working farmers over their own political agenda and give back a tax break for this costly uh, government tax break? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the House has already pronounced itself on this particular bill, but I will talk about support for farmers. Why is it that the leader of the official opposition cut $200 million while he was at the Cabinet table to support farmers for business risk management? Mr. Speaker, the leader of the official opposition is not worth the risk, and he wants to balance the budget on the backs of farmers. And on this side of the House, we will always stand up for farmers. The Honourable Member from Desnete, uh, Miss Nippy, Churchill River. Mr. Speaker, that response will do nothing to shorten food bank lineups. After eight years, this Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. Lineups at food banks have never been so long. People are hurting, hurting bad, and this NDP Liberal government still plans to quadruple their carbon tax on gas, groceries, and home heat. Bill C-234 will lower taxes for farmers who produce our food. This will lower the cost of groceries. It's just common sense. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister tell his appointed senators to put people first and pass Bill C-234 so Canadians can afford to eat? Great question. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to remind the member that pr putting a price on pollution is what enables us to reduce emissions by the equivalent of removing from our roads 11 million vehicles. Right. So imagine Canada right now. There's 26 million vehicles in, on our roads. Imagine if we added 11 million vehicles, the pollution that we, we would see in our cities, the level of asthma that our kids would have to go through. This is not happening because we've put a plan in place to help fight pollution, to help fight climate change, and to support Canadians in the process, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. The Honourable Member from Lakeland. After eight years, just like they wanted, the NDP Liberal blocks carbon tax hikes the cost of heating, cooling and fuel, so it hikes the price of food. The PM showed it when he paused it for some, but not for 97 per cent of Canadians. Common sense Conservatives will axe the tax for all for good because we know it's not worth the cost and so do Canadians. But will Liberal Senators stop blocking the Conservative Bill C-234 to cut the tax on farm fuels so farmers can afford to feed Canadians and so Canadians can afford to eat. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for in the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think facts matter in this conversation. According to the Bank of Canada, the Governor of Bank of Canada, putting a price on pollution has contributed to inflation for 0.15%, Mr. Speaker. Not 15%, like what the Conservatives are saying, 0.15%. And economists agree across the country that our pollution pricing system puts more money back into the eight out of ten households in Canada than it does. So we, if we take that away, we will take money away from Canadians, which is not, which is no surprise coming from the Conservative Party. They're simply not there for Canadians, and they're not worth the risk. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, it's being reported that Russia is getting made in Canada landmine detonators through Kyrgyzstan. This would mean that Canada, that Russia is using Canadian-made detonators in Ukraine. Mr. Speaker, this is outrageous. Canada used to be a leader in demining efforts, and we should be doing everything we can to help Ukraine demine. Instead, because of weak arms and sanction enforcement, Canada may actually be inadvertently arming Russia. Can the minister confirm these reports and explain why Canada is even exporting landmine detonators at all? 
The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for her question. We will look into what she has brought to our attention and report back. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Nanaimo Ladysmith. Mr. Speaker, people in Nanaimo Ladysmith are struggling to find an affordable place to call home. All the while, the Liberals delay needed help. They've even put off housing funding in the fall economic statement until 2025. But it's not shocking since the Liberals and Conservatives have spent years putting people on the back burner so their rich friends can get richer off of housing. People need homes now, not in two years. So will the Liberals immediately release the promised funding to finally build affordable homes? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. As a result of measures introduced by this government, Mr. Speaker, two million people are now living in homes, wow. homes that have either been built, repaired or subsidized through programs introduced, and that work continues. In fact, we saw this week, through the fall economic statement, that there are a variety of other supports being introduced. Low interest loans for builders, taking a, a very close look at the work that pro uh, municipalities, excuse me, are doing on short-term rentals, freeing up short-term rentals to make them into long-term homes for individuals and families. We have more work to do. We're going to do it in collaboration with parties that actually want to help. Here, here. Then I have Deputy Lac Saint Louis. General Member for Lac Saint Louis. The Canadians are struggling with the cost of housing. Unlike the Conservative leaders' plan, we're making the investments necessary to get Canada building again. And guess what, Mr. Speaker, it's working. Statistics Canada has reported that investment in multi-unit home construction is up over 8% with all provinces reporting increases. But we're not stopping there. The fall economic statement is bringing more solutions to make sure we're building homes and building them faster. Can the Parliamentary Secretary for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities tell Canadians what new housing measures we're putting forward through the fall economic statement? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. That member, Mr. Speaker, has served his country and his community since 2004, and this caucus and this chamber are better for it. He continues to advocate for measures, as does this caucus, and what is the result? In the fall economic statement, we saw, as I just mentioned, uh, real action to deal with short-term rentals. The result will be up to 30,000 short-term rentals turned into long-term homes for Canadians. Wow. We'll work with municipalities on that. Low interest loans for builders. All of these measures make a difference, Mr. Speaker. On the Conservative side, we see nothing. We see no tangible measures. They want to put a tax, in fact, on the construction of middle class. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Rideau Lakes, Thousand Islands. The Prime Minister is spending billions of taxpayer dollars on foreign workers to fill jobs at a manufacturing plant in Ontario. He's not worth the cost and his NDP Liberal government can't keep their story straight. The minister from Edmonton says it's just going to be one. This minister here said it's going to be a few. The hiring firm says it's going to be 900. The Windsor police say it's 1,600 workers from overseas to fill this plant in southern Ontario. Will they release the contract so Canadians can find out how many workers from overseas $15 billion buys. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Speaker, instead of talking the Canadian economy down, they should celebrate that someone is investing $3.4 billion of their money, Mr. Speaker, to build a plan in Windsor. But let me say what, what an expert says about the Conservative, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Here's what Brennan Sweeney of the Trillium Network for Advanced Manufacturing had to say about them. I think those making this noise are hypocritical. Whoa. What they're saying is erroneous and factually incorrect. They don't have the faintest knowledge of the industry. Street, Mr. Speaker. That's what experts are saying about the Conservative. We're going to continue to fight for Canadian workers. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Vito Lakes. I guess it's a question of who Canadians want to believe. The NDP Liberal cover-up coalition or the Windsor Police who say it's 1,600 replacement workers coming from overseas to work at this plant in southern Ontario. 15 billion taxpayer dollars to fund workers from foreign soil. After eight years, it's clear that this NDP Liberal Prime Minister simply isn't worth the cost. So, will the minister put his disinformation and distraction aside and finally release the contracts so Canadians can get the truth about how many replacement workers Canadians get for $15 billion. Good job. Good job.
The Honourable Minister for Innovation. But one thing that Canadians know, and I know them, they're watching this morning, they know not to believe the Conservative, Mr. Speaker, because they have seen this week how what they're able to do when it comes to misinformation and disinformation, Mr. Speaker. But let me bring some facts to this story, Mr. Speaker. The company is going to invest $3.4 billion of their money to build one of the largest battery plants in Canada. The CEO is saying that they're going to have 2,500 Canadian workers at the plant and up to 2,300 workers to build the plan, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to fight for Canadian workers, fight for industry, and fight for Windsor. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, this NDP Liberal government is spending billions on taxpayer-funded foreign replacement workers to build a battery factory in Windsor. The Liberal Minister from Edmonton said there was only one foreign replacement worker. The Liberal Minister of Industry said there would be a fairly small number. Now the company itself says at least 900, and the Windsor Police said 1,600. Since these NDP Liberals can't get their story straight, will they release the contract to show Canadians how many taxpayer-funded foreign replacement workers will be replacing Canadian workers. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I will take no lesson from this Conservative, Mr. Speaker. It might be Friday morning, Mr. Speaker, but Canadians know something. They've done nothing for Windsor. They've done nothing for our industry. They've done nothing for our workers, Mr. Speaker. If it was not for us, Mr. Speaker, the auto industry would not be thriving, Mr. Speaker. Not only we landed a Stellantis plan in this country, Mr. Speaker, we now have Volkswagen, we now have Nordville, we have Ford, we have GM, Mr. Speaker. While they talk down our countries, we're going to continue to fight to get investment in this place. The Honourable Member from Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, anything to avoid answering the question, Mr. Speaker. After eight years, uh, can they finally be clear and transparent with Canadians? Just once. Just once. We know that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, and this subsidy to a private business will cost every Canadian household $1,000. Will this NDP Liberal government release the contracts, or are they going to continue to keep the details of this deal secret from how they're subsidizing a private company's jobs and giving foreign replacement for paying for foreign replacement workers. <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'm so happy that, that my colleague, for whom I have enormous respect, keep asking me questions because it allows me on a Friday morning to inform Canadians, you know, well, because watching. Canadians are watching and are wondering are. what is going on on the other side. They've seen the Conservative go this week and they're going way down, Mr. Speaker, after voting against the free trade agreement with Ukraine, Mr. Speaker. Now they'd like Canadians to believe that when a company invests $3.4 billion of their own money, it's a subsidy, Mr. Speaker. Canadians must be watching at home and say, what's going on with the Conservative, Mr. Speaker? But on this side, they know that we'll keep fighting for them. The Honourable Member for Sentia saint bagot Mr. Speaker, aerospace workers are urging the Liberals to issue a call for tenders for the replacement of the Auroras. The Machinists Union published an open letter this morning. The union criticized Ottawa's decision to offer a $9 billion contract to Boeing without a call for tenders, which completely ignores Quebec's expertise. I quote from the open letter, Canada is missing out on an opportunity to generate significant local benefits and is undermining a strategic wealth-creating industry. Will Ottawa finally issue a call for tenders so that Quebec can compete? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I agree with the member. We do need to replace the Aurora fleet, but we need to replace them with what meets the operational requirements of the Canadian Armed Forces. And Mr. Speaker, no decision has been made yet. Yes, the Honourable Member for saint saint -Bagot. But, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals can't offer $9 billion to an American aerospace giant without even letting Quebec's companies compete. What's more, they can't offer $9 billion to Boeing, knowing that Boeing has in the past tried to crush Quebec's aerospace industry in 2016 with illegal punitive tariffs. The Liberals have even had to invent a Boeing clause in other competitions to avoid giving our money to companies that are trying to harm us. How can the Liberals today want to offer Boeing a contract without even tendering? That prevents Quebec from bidding. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear about this today. No decision has been made yet, but we will make our decision based on what the Canadian Armed Forces needs are. And I will repeat again in this place that no decision has been made yet. We will continue to work with stakeholders and collaborate. But, Mr. Speaker, our priority is meeting the Canadian Armed Forces' needs in order to help us ensure the security and defence of our country. Mr. Speaker, this week the NDP Liberal government blocked a Conservative motion to have a whistleblower testify at the Ethics Committee about the billion-dollar green slush fund scandal. After eight years under this Prime Minister, there's been scandal after scandal. It's easy to see that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Facing an Auditor General investigation and an Ethics Commissioner investigation, the CEO and Liberal hand-picked Board Chair resigned in disgrace. Now they're blocking a whistleblower from testifying. What are they trying? To hide. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm grateful for the question uh, from the member. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, from the moment we had delegation, I am the minister who ordered an investigation to make sure that Excellent. we could get to the bottom of this, Mr. Speaker. But not only, I suspended the fund to make sure that there would be good governance before uh, we could restore the funding of the organization. The CEO of the organization has resigned. I have accepted the resignation of the chair of the board. And, Mr. Speaker, we have appointed an independent law firm so that whistleblower can go to them, tell their story, so to make sure that we go to the bottom of this, restore governance and restore funding to Canadian companies. The Honourable Member from Sarnia Lambton. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's not the way it happened. Okay, it was the Conservatives that called for the investigation at committee. It was the Conservatives that got the Auditor General and the Ethics Commissioner to start an investigation. Now we want a whistleblower to come to committee and talk about who got rich, and they are being silenced by these NDP Liberal governments. So what are they hiding? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, give me a break. I know it's Friday morning and here the members on Friday are going a bit like, you know, it's, it's the time of joy, the weekend is coming. But for God's sake, to pretend that the Conservative would have done anything? Really? Canadians are watching. One thing they know, Mr. Speaker, once I receive allegation, I demanded the investigation. To pretend that the Conservative, which were sleeping on the switch, Mr. Speaker, would have done anything, Canadians know better. We'll get to the bottom of this, we'll restore governance, and we'll make sure we can fund Canadian companies. The Honourable Member from Edmonton, Edmonton Manning. Sleeping at the switch. The Auditor General and the Ethics Commissioner are investigating the Liberals' hand-picked CEO and chair of the billion-dollar ah, Green Slush Fund. Right. This is a new scandal, a big scandal, and the NTP Liberal cover-up coalition is trying to hide the truth from Canadian again by blocking the testimony of a whistleblower at the Ethics Committee. What is the NTP Liberal cover-up coalition is trying to hide? Great question. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Mr. Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'm so happy to be here this Friday to answer these questions. Mr. Speaker, it seems that the Conservative forget facts when it suits their story, Mr. Speaker. Maybe some on their bench would remember that it was a Conservative government which had already appointed the chair of the organization in a previous role, Mr. Speaker. But what matters, Mr. Speaker, is that one thing we said to Canadians, we we're going we're to go to the bottom of this, we're going to investigate the allegation, we're going to restore governance, Mr. Speaker, and then we're going to be able to fund Canadian companies. And I think that the Conservative, Mr. Speaker, should stop making story and stick to the facts. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, Canadians benefited from the support of community organizations and not-for-profits. And now, these organizations are struggling with the income and they're struggling with rising costs as well and with the rising demand for services. They struggle to attract and retain volunteers and staff. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Families tell us what she is doing uh, to improve the situation and to help these organizations? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I thank our very dynamic uh, colleague, for the member for Pontiac. Through our Community Services Recovery Fund, 
Nearly 5,500 organizations across the country have received funding. In the member for Pontiac's riding, this means that groups like La Coopérative de Solidarité and the Centre Communautaire de Wakefield La Pêche can continue to operate a safe and sustainable community space for arts, culture, and re recreation that welcomes and inspires people of all ages. It also means that organizations like the Alzheimer Outaway Society can continue to work and support Pontiac's families who may be affected by a neurocognitive disorder. These are local groups that make a real difference. Nose Hill. Tomorrow is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Hamas brutally raped, murdered, and kidnapped Israeli women. They desecrated their bodies. They used Palestinian women as human shields. And yet many international women's rights groups, like UN Women, are silent. Shame on them. Mm -hmm. These groups' refusals to denounce Hamas's violence against women is normalizing anti-Semitic violence, around the world. It has to stop. Will the government join me today in harshly denouncing UN women's silence and publicly demand on the eve of tomorrow's day that they end it? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we condemn Hamas, a terrorist organization. We condemn their actions against women and other civilians. Today, we actually got good news out of the region when the first hostages have been released yeah. under the agreement that was signed and in, imminently there will be aid flowing into the region. We, we continue to call for the um, protection of Palestinian and Israeli civilians. We call on Canadians and host, uh, Canadian and foreign national hostages to be released, for foreign nationals to leave, and for all the hostages to be released. The Honourable Member from Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals' least restrictive condition prison reforms have led to a skyrocketing number of dangerous offenders being transferred out of maximum security. Last year, it was a shocking 505 transfers, and one of these was the notorious serial killer Paul Bernardo. Now, the review into Bernardo's transfer cited the Liberals' least restrictive policy multiple times. The Liberals are responsible for this failure. Why are they doubling down instead of committing to fix this terrible law. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important when talking about uh, issues as serious as a notorious killer like Mr. Bernardo that we stick to the facts and not mislead Canadians. We've seen earlier this week what happens when you're talking about a sensitive, concerning matter and you right. use language that doesn't respect the facts of the situation. My honourable friend knows very well, Mr. Speaker, that decisions around the classification of inmate security are properly in the hands of correctional service officials and those officials are accountable for those decisions and those decisions are guided by what keeps Canadians safe. The Honourable Member from Lanark, Frontenac, uh, Kingston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Also on the subject of corrections, Mr. Speaker, on a recent visit to George Thill Institution, I was informed that personnel at Corrections Canada have been trying to introduce Red Seal apprenticeship programs so that inmates can re-enter the workforce with real job training. So, after eight years of Liberal government uh, and the Liberals running the Corrections Service, how many federal inmates are enrolled in Red Seal programs? Which programs are they enrolled in? And how many per program? How many have graduated and from which trades? And finally, is there a plan to assist inmates to finish their respective programs upon release? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my Honourable Friend for what is a very good question. I uh, will be very happy to get those exact details and provide them to the member. I can tell him that as a member of Parliament for Beausejour, when I visit the medium security uh, prison, uh, the Dorchester Penitentiary. I have met inmates and Corcan staff that work on exactly those programs, and I share his view that if we can give inmates the skills uh, and ensure that, for example, they complete high school education, learn a trade, it'll make them much more likely to successfully reintegrate into Correct. society when they finish their sentences, and that keeps Canadians safe as well. Here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker, climate change costs the Canadian economy and Canadians in their pocketbooks every day. So if you don't have a plan for the environment, you don't have a plan for the economy. Despite Conservatives denying climate change, our government understands the need to act now. With an economic plan that supports the middle class, creates good jobs, 
all while protecting the planet. So could the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Industry please share with Canadians more about our government's work in building a clean economy? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, first let me start by thanking my colleague from Etobicoke Centre for the great question and for his advocacy. Canadian workers need an economic plan that will deliver good jobs that last for generations as the global economy shifts toward net zero. We've already seen over 90 clean growth projects choose Canada in the last three years alone, which is valued at over $40 billion. More and more companies are choosing Canada thanks to our plan and our workers. The fall economic statement lays out clear timelines for the delivery and implementation of a clean economy investment tax credit regime, all with labour requirements to ensure good jobs for Canadians. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Churchill, Kiwatsunakaski. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, the UN voted to create a historic global tax convention. But instead of voting with most of the world for tax fairness, Canada voted no. This government chose to stand with billionaire corporations committed to hiding their money. If the Liberals really wanted to take on corporate greed and tax evasion during a period of record profits, they should have supported this resolution. Canadians struggling with sky-high grocery prices and rent deserve an explanation. Why are Liberals opposing the world's efforts for tax fairness and choosing to stand with billionaires instead of hardworking Canadians. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, the member asks about tax fairness. Since 2015, this government has invested no less than a billion dollars to ensure that the CRA has the resources it needs, resources that that side cut, the Conservatives, when it was in office, to ensure exactly that. Tax fairness is a principle we take very seriously. I would just point to the outcome of the Panama Papers, for example, where as a result of investments that we've made, we've seen investigations on tax avoidance and tax evasion go up. Convictions are up as well. We'll continue this good work. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, access to clean drinking water is a human right. Could the Minister Indigenous Services inform themselves as to when the government will provide appropriate funding and technical resources to train and certify First Nations people to become water infrastructure operators in their home communities? Can the Minister also indicate whether Indigenous operators will be paid at a level that eliminates the wage gap with operators in non-Indigenous communities? Mr. Speaker, it's 2023. First Nations should be empowered with the skills and the jobs to provide clean water. The government clearly hasn't been able to do it. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for this very important question, and it's a concern that I deeply share as well. Everyone deserves access to clean and safe drinking water. We're fully committed to lifting all remaining long-term drinking water advisories in First Nation communities. In partnership with communities, we've already lifted 143 long-term advisories since 2015. There is now clean water in more than 96% of First Nations communities, and we're committed to finishing the work of the remaining 4%. For each of these remaining advisories, there is a project team, a fully funded plan in place. We will not stop until we get the job done and make clean water a reality for every community. <laughs> Et avec cela, la période est... That brings question period to an end.